Welcome to the magic of human beings. This episode I would like to dedicate to my friend because yesterday was two months that she died, Debbie Huggett. And the magic of human beings was created in the end of last year. And uh, we've been under so much challenging uncertainty, fear and anxiety. And also I had friends and family dying and that putting everything into perspective. I am going to give you a quote from Goethe. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power and magic in it. So I wanted to create the magic of human beings because there are so many wonderful people out there doing beautiful and wonderful things and meaningful things. I wanted to share these stories about challenge, change and transformation and connect with each other in a human level. It is very important for me to share, celebrate and cherish their journey and creativity. So on that note, today we have uh, our guest, it's a force of nature. He's an artist, he's a theatre maker. He's unbelievable. He works on all kinds of things. I'm not going to tell you much more because let's hear from him. Johnny G! Oh, hello. Yes, that's not much of a build-up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tony, how are you? I'm I'm all right. I'm okay. You know, like it's a, it's a funny old time, and it. I, I liked your quote from Goethe. I I finished the the book that I wrote years ago, the uh, workshop, a movable feast. I finished with that quote. Oh, is that this book? That's that book. Yes, it's near the end of that book. It's upside down, Carol. But that book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that book. Yes, so yeah. Anyway, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to talk and answer your questions and let's have a chat. Okay, so let's start about your background. Tell us about my background. Tell, uh, well, I uh, was born in northwest London and uh, moved to Singapore when I was 10 months old. And by the time we came back, when I was two and a half, my father had died very tragically. Uh, he was a surgeon out there and my sister was born. So it was um, my mum and my new sister and me moved back and we moved about in London quite a lot. And eventually my mother found a place for us to live after we'd lived in lots of different houses uh, in West Hampstead, uh, just off West End Lane. And it was brilliant. It was a big block of flats called Chomley Gardens and the middle was a huge communal garden. And I think that communal garden had a big effect on me. So, um, and also I was a child of the late 60s, early 70s and quite rebellious. And I didn't like my school, which was an all boys school. Oh. And so I escaped in lots of ways and I went and saw lots of music and I you saw mean, the... you escaped in the night, during the night? I, I know, I just had adventures. I, had, I was born into a wonderful period where I had amazing freedom and I moved around London. I went to so many gigs. I saw The Who about 20 times, The Stones about 20 times the kind of Bob Marley everything but I was really that, that was my sort of religion really and uh, I, I had I wanted to do something about the education system because I found the way I was being educated was well, not that good really I thought I wanted more participation I wanted to be more active so my ambition was to change the education system anyway what age were you when you're thinking about changing the educational system? About 15 or 16. 
I was, I, uh, yeah, I started it's... reading books like A.S. Neal and John Holt and uh, 36 Children, I think, by Cole and uh, uh, all, all sorts of books about education. And I started, but... yeah. But you saying, I just came something in, um, in my mind because you're saying like you were 15. So I wonder if your mom had any influence on that. Oh, God. Now, you're kind of asking me. My mum was an extraordinary woman. So, you know, she, kind of, she, she escaped from Germany before the war when she was four years old. She went to school in Switzerland and France, uh, Germany, Switzerland, France and England before she was uh, 10 years old. She... Uh, she lost her father, she lost a brother, and then she lost her husband, as I just told you. And she was an actress. She went to RADA. So, and... Uh, oh, wow! And she stopped being an actress and became a speech therapist. She was quite a well-known speech therapist in the end to support us. And uh, she also re... Uh, restarted a relationship with an old flame when I was about nine or ten who was also an actor and was quite famous at the time so did she have an effect on me yes yeah, she had an effect um, you work with me the whole time Carol and if you, you know what I'm like so they're they're <laughs> big they're big bits of my mother in there my mum if she had a point to make she'd go right let's sit down around the kitchen table and talk this out and that could last for days until she got <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah and she also allowed me to do a lot so yes i was i had a lot of freedom oh. so um i wanted to work with children all my life um and i didn't know what i wanted to do when i left school and i did philosophy and sociology at university i trained as a youth and community worker I started youth clubs and a daycare nursery in London, and I'm going to jump because otherwise we'll be here <laughs> all day about my background, as you know. <laughs> so yes. several, several, moving several years later to about 84, I went to visit a friend of mine called Enzo, who's a lovely man, and uh, he, he's from Chile. He was a Chilean refugee. And I said, what are you doing, Enzo? He said, well, I started this public company, but I have no one to translate the script. And I have all these gigs, but I don't know how to do the administration. And I said, well, Enzo, I'll help you do the administration. He said, that would be great. You turn up at this hall tomorrow and I'll tell you what to do. And I went to this hall in Stockwell. He said, Tony, you will be the narrator in the show. You will make this <laughs> puppet. You will make so overnight. I became a puppeteer. So that's where I started. Administrator. He invited you to go there to be administrator. I didn't do any. Like, excuse me. Could you? <laughs> yeah. No. It was like I honestly had no thought before that day in 1984 anything about puppets. So. And what I loved about it was that this universe opened up for me where yeah. I had, first of all, I like that. I mean, opening universes is, is the whole of my work, really. If I can open a universe, and especially for others, then I'm very happy. Um, that's, and I'm missing it hugely in not opening universes um, or making worlds. And yeah, so, so with the puppetry, it was like I can have control over a process. I don't have to have anyone telling me what to do or how to do it. And so I made my first puppet, which was a condor, because the show was called Il Tomate e El Condor, the tomato and the condor. <laughs> the tomato and the condor. Yeah. And, and look, you know, that's, that's how I started. And then there, then, and what we're talking about, we're talking about 36 years ago. So there's a lot of, that's the background. So I became a puppeteer and I like having control over a process. 
and I wanted to work with children and I believed totally in the power of imagination and how children needed their imaginations exercising and kindling. So that's what my work, uh, without me being conscious of it, became more and more about that. And so you were performing first, like... Uh... Well, yes, I didn't have any notion of running workshops, particularly at that stage. We did the Tomato and the Condor, Condor. and then stuff happened, and I moved to Devon. I mean, there's another long story, but I'll make it quick. <laughs> my, old, my old friend Patrick, Patrick Cooper, who's written several books and who I still collaborate with and is a lovely man, had just come back from India and bought a house near Totnes. So uh, Claire and I came down here and my grandmother had died and we had, I don't know, 5,000 pounds left to us. And we said, well, let's see if we can buy a house in Totnes. And there was one house we could afford. And in those days, you could say anything to a mortgage company and they'd give you money. And I told Claire, I can guarantee you, I'll earn 12 pounds a week. 12 when... pounds a week? <laughs> As a puppeteer. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Uh, Patrick and I wrote three shows together and performed them about uh, based around the Robin Hood's legends, about his childhood, about magic, and, uh, and, and then about his death, actually, uh, and, the, and extinction, an ecological myth. So we invented myths around the Robin Hood myths. And then Patrick went to Spain and I did a lot more shows and I performed at the Tricycle and the Lyric Hammersmith and all sorts of odd places and festivals, Glastonbury, all sorts of things. And so, when did you get, because now you mentioned myth, when did you get interesting myths? Well, I think that, uh, when did I get interested in myths? Well, I suppose unconsciously I've always been interested Okay, yeah, I was. I have books of myths from when I was a child, before I was ten, and uh, I've drawn in them and things. So I read all the Greek myths and all the Nordic myths and the Russian myths. I've got books upstairs. Very lucky to have a very expansive family, who just uh, gave me lots of things to read and and then lots of cinema, lots of. I mean, I had a very, had a very fantastic, and the longer I lived, the more I think how fantastic my childhood, and it wasn't without challenge, you know, but it was, I mean, people died and people kind of, there were all sorts, it wasn't easy, it wasn't easy. There was alcoholism and things like that, but it was brilliant. And, um, and so I was interested in Miss then, but I think, if you're talking about when did the idea for what you and I do together begin, it happened one day in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> not too much details. <laughs> so, not not with you. <laughs> this is a long time ago. I don't know how old you were then. You were a child, and um, uh, my young son, my son, who's now forty had come home and written a, had been asked to write about the professions people did in Totnes. And he wrote that they're bus drivers, they're shopkeepers, they're all sorts of people, and they're puppeteers. And in the bath, and baths are good places to think, you know, walks, things come to you in the bath, and other places too, which you won't go into. So, uh, so I was in the bath and I thought, God, he's got a good idea. There are a lot of puppeteers. What if I got them all together and made one big workshop? And I thought, yes. And I thought we could set a world record for the biggest puppet show on earth if I got 15 puppeteers running workshops. So I rang up the local arts uh, society at Dartington and I said to uh, a friend there who happened to be the arts officer and is still a friend. 
what if we set a new Guinness World Record at the Civic Hall? And he said, I like that. So we did it. I mean, I'm not going to tell you, but what happened yeah. was extraordinary. The switchboard sold out in about kind of five minutes, you know. It was booked up with 200 people participating, 15 puppeteers. It was called the Guests of Chance because we didn't know what would happen. And by four or five o'clock in the evening, we did a show called The Guests of Chance. And the audience was 300 people. And uh, we sent it up to Guinness. And I just looked at it and I thought, good grief, I hadn't realised this is what people can do together. This is like 200, and 200 working days in one day because there are 200 people doing it. And it was a little while longer. Do you mind, I mean, if I'm going on. No, to, no, that's. I, I can. A little while longer, a head teacher that I knew. Uh, I used to do some. I already started doing some residencies in a school in Timmouth. And the new head teacher there said, Could you. We got a multicultural theme. Could you make a show there? And two artist friends. Uh, what, you, who you know, Mandy and Martin, yeah. I rang them up and said, look, let's go into uh, the, a, a workshop together and see whether we can make a show in a few days with the three of us. And so we made the first uh, creation myth we did was Nyami and the Sky Spirits yeah. from, uh, from uh, West Africa. And it was it was just what happened to the children was that they turned from people sitting at their desks like this to kind of luminous orbs of light, you know, and I thought, what happened? What what happened? And I thought and so there are a whole lot of things that happened. I thought, well it's a workshop and this is what I want to do. So I'm I could I, I talk love that luminous orbit. <laughs> of light yeah no they were luminous you know they were just kind of there you know because you do the work with me and with the others with Anna and with Roz and with Martin and with Charlie and with Leah and all the people who come and work with us and and Ken and Melissa, Melissa. let's not yeah let's not forget them at all and it just like the joy in the room and the love, the love and the joy are, you know, I, I, it um, is extraordinary kind of the children love what they're doing and it brings them a lot of joy to be creative, creative. That's as simple as that. So was that the start of creation with puppets? Uh, well, I mean, it, you see, origins are really complex. We live in a kind of society. We have a, a mythology that kind of buys into the idea of a single origin. So there was, there was a big bang or God <laughs> created the world. But actually what happens in my experience is worlds are starting the whole time and there are probably parallel universes and there, maybe there wasn't a single origin because what happened before the Big Bang is a mystery. How did, how did God come into existence? These are mysteries. How nothing becomes something is a mystery. And I've forgotten what the question was. Cause I... <laughs> <laughs> well, the question was like that was the start of creation with puppets like was the first game yeah game. so so i think it was like what i saw what i then saw having done my first creation myth was a that they could accommodate a lot of children and i started to research creation myths but b what i realized was that the story of nyami as the maker was the same as the story that the children were engaged in. So there's a resonance. The story of creation myths is the relationship between nothing and something, Absolutely. how nothing becomes something. And that doesn't mean that it has to be the whole world or all the stars or the whole cosmos. That's happening. There's a relationship between the infinite and the finite, and it's not a size thing. It can be a puppet. 
So there's something magical about walking into a space, as you know, because we've done it yep. so much, 100,000 times at least. <laughs> and they kind of, they come in there and there's just cardboard and sticks. And then, boof, they're holding this thing in their hand and they're kind of like, I've done that. I don't believe I've done that in two hours. And you see, and then after that, you know, they, they go and we go, well, you're going to perform to kind of hundreds of people in the hall. You're not going to be seen, so the puppets are performing. You, and so it gives them a safety net, yeah. uh, and then they get a huge amount of esteem from being for making something that's not just children performing. It's something that's authentic, has authentic quality as a piece of theatre. So having seen that once, that's kind of like became a thing, but it wasn't the only thing that happened then. Mm -hmm. That was one path. There were okay. other paths. And was around that time that you involved with Movable Feast? Well, so the big question at the end of that first creation myth was, well, I just did a workshop. And then I thought, then the question arrived. So you see, kind of, because like Goethe says, you invite something in, something invites you in. And all sorts of things start happening. So the, the question was, well, but I thought, well, what's a workshop? And I thought, that's such a good question. I'm going to write a book about it. And so I rang up um, Routledge and I said, because this is how naive I am. And I said, I'm writing a book. Can I talk to someone? <laughs> I haven't written anything. And they said, oh, we'll put you through to the theatre editor. <laughs> so I'm talking to the She said, what are you writing a book about? I said, workshop. And she said, well, what's it about? <laughs> and I haven't written a word yet. So that went on for kind of a, she actually, in, to her great credit, she kept in contact with me while well, nothing happened really. But then I did a master's and so, and I in thought, applied well, theater. in applied theatre and I thought I'm not, and I got money from the Arts Council to interview people on the question of what is workshop. And I went to the Royal Shakespeare Company, National Theatre, the Scrap Store, all over the place interviewed dancers, painters, poets, made friends. Fantastic. But I thought, I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this because I couldn't get any money to develop my practice. So I'm going to make a project where others can develop their practice. And that uh, was uh, called Movable Feast. And we... And, oh. But yeah. then... A bit like Goethe said, the magic, and I, I kind of, I'm, I'm reticent to keep saying magic, but it was magic. Somebody walking along Totnes High Street said, I teach uh, workshop skills at Dartington College of Arts and I can't do it anymore. And I heard you're interested in it, in workshop. And I said, yeah. He said, what do you want to take over the course? So, <laughs> so I... <laughs> And at the time, there was a wonderful woman called Mary Schwartz, who you also know. Yes. And she was running a thing called the Centre for Creative Enterprise and Participation. And she said, uh, well, let's put a project together. So we've, we put the first movable feast together at Dartington in 2004, April 2004. And then that became a company in 2007 I think okay yeah so and, and was a company that involved many artists and well the we ran movable feasts with about 300 artists they went on running as uh, as development uh, le developing practice through practice we ran workshops on workshops for people who ran workshops okay and uh, <laughs> And it works. Well, the idea, the theory, the premise is, is the workshop works. Why use a different form? Why go? I don't know what the answer is. What is a workshop? I haven't got one answer. There's not one answer to it. It's a fluid thing. It is a movable feast. That's why it was called that. 
and everybody yeah. brings their own qualities to it. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, there is some specificity that you can use in workshops that make them work. There is specificity in workshops mm -hmm. and I'm currently yeah. writing a book about the specificities of workshop with my friend in Canada who I'm collaborating with. There are specificities and you're right. And it was the specificities of workshop that meant that we took, we could form a company and explore those specificities together and get a common methodology amongst artists who worked in diverse disciplines. So we had uh, digital artists, sculptors, poets, all sorts. And we, we put workshops together and worked with uh, disabled youth and disadvantaged youth. And we ran lots and lots of workshops and they were fantastic. And then, I don't want to get overly political, then the Conservatives came in and they took a big dump on all the organisations that uh, employed us. I'm sorry to call it that, but they shut them all down and we had kind of all our work stopped and it was hard work. So that's when creation myths... Correction. Well, then I've... You... Uh, I don't know because you you know me and I can talk an awful lot. So I tell me if I, I guess the idea is that I do talk. So, uh, so and then, what? So well, move yeah, or feast. Well, move, move or feast eventually had to shut down because it was a lot of work keeping it going, and um, and there wasn't. Uh, it was, I, I run out of energy for finding work really. And in some ways the work's always come to me. Well, for most of my working life, people have asked me to do things. So, um, and people were always asking me to make big puppet shows. <laughs> and so I thought, well. And you were the right person for them to ask that. <laughs> Uh, be <laughs> because one, so okay, so let's go for. We are talking about workshops and specificity, and you're writing a book about it right now, which is fantastic. Because from knowing your workshops, like the stories and rituals that you use, which can bring everyone together, like the magic carpet, the sacred box of eyes. So, mm. could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, I don't know which bit to go to because it's quite a big subject. But basically, uh, I, I put a, I put a lot of work, and especially in the first twenty years of working, every workshop we spent kind of sometimes days preparing it. So a lot of it is hidden for the facilitator, for the workshop leader. Uh, and I think the best term is the story guide, because every workshop is about uh, the participants telling their story. Sometimes, I mean, it doesn't have to be. So the fact that I run puppet workshops, to me, it's not particularly kind of about the puppets. It's a, mm -hmm. always about the people. So you're thinking what's relevant for the people. So the first thing that's specific is how you prepare and plan for it. And then when you get into the delivery phase, you're, uh, you are, you've got a beginning, a middle and an end. So the beginning of our residencies is at that introduction. So you're talking about the magic there. The beginning yeah, there is that we... So when I started working with Patrick, way, 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 way back, back then, <laughs> way, way back... Um, me, uh, Patrick and I spent three days in a workshop, in our little kind of workshop, in our little um, studio, working out what we do in a, in a workshop. And it, it basically formed the foundation because we said, this is, we're giving this as much attention as we do our shows. And we, he just read uh, a book about Peter Brook's Conference of the Birds. The, oh yes by a guy called peter halprin i think and uh about his touring in africa and peter brooks uh only real prop was a carpet 
and we decided to buy a carpet and that would be our prop. So that was the carpet. And you're quite right, because the carpet is all about uh, transforming the space before the participants get in, especially if they've got an expectation of what their space is. If you exceed the expectation, then you've got to begin to get a good platform. Now it's a so exceeding expectation is for me what workshops are about making mm -hmm. something extraordinary making something that didn't exist before yep and so in that way it's an art it's a, it's 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 a, an art form for me that's what i decided i drop in performance yeah so um so then uh, then at the very first <laughs> All these circles within circles. At the very first, the guests of chance in the civic hall with the 15 puppeteers, I had a, one of those little grey boxes, cash boxes you get in the bank. Have you ever seen those? No. And in it, well, they're little boxes, you know, okay. they're just little boxes like this. And I had the eyes in. And you know how when you put the eyes on the puppet, it comes to life. Yes. So I had the eyes in there and I said, well, in here, when you've made your puppet, you can come and get your couple of eyes off this box. I mean, this was way back. And uh, I, and one child said, that box is special. And another child said, yes, it's sacred. And then these 200 people suddenly went, oh, no, not the sacred, sacred box, box of eyes. eyes. <laughs> and so I thought, so this is another thing that's specific. Um, so the specific, the big specificity about workshop is that it's a dual process, two, two processes, D-U-A-L, not J-E-W-E-L. It's a dual process where, the, where there is the social process going on and the social dynamic and there's the creative process and the creative dynamic. And as a facilitator or workshop leader, you're trying to knit those together to, so that the participants get the most out of it. So just to finish off, it's about their story and what they manifest get is a vehicle for their kind of their inner story. And you can't know that. So I use stories and what in theatre we call conceits. So the conceit is something that will assist an audience to suspend their disbelief. So you might not know this, but this green stick and this paper clip, the people who invented these might have lived next door to each other because the paper clip fits perfectly onto the green stick. That's a conceit. That, I mean, like we know that the, yes. that the children are like this and it's about their attention oh, i'm just gonna for who doesn't know what we're talking about it's like we've got green sticks and we got paper clips that go inside them so that's and this is one of the explanations that he gives to the children that they all get what's happening what <laughs> and, so, and yeah tony and talking about workshop like what i admire so much about you is your energy and passion. You're such a force of nature. Uh, it's like when we are in a workshop, you are unstoppable. It's like, I don't know, where do you get this energy from? And how do you keep it up? Because it, for who hasn't seen you in a workshop, is it's, you're like, wow. I think that the answer is quite clear to you, Carol. I eat lots of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Pip has just asked me, what do you eat for breakfast, Tony? <laughs> well, the answer is one piece of toast, Pippa. So the, uh, not anymore, not anymore. Now you change. <laughs> oh, yeah, I eat a bit of muesli because it lasts longer. Now I'm trying to do that better. But um, 
so the look the where do i get the energy from it's yeah. motivation this is all about motivating Patience. and i told you when i was 15 i wanted to change the education system well obviously i can't do that and i don't want to be the minister of education although god knows we could do with a new one at the moment because that guy is a anyway so um <laughs> So I didn't want to do that, but I what I what happened was through an enormous amount of coincidences all coming together. I found something where I was in my element, and I'm not got that energy the whole time, uh, as uh, my wife Claire, she came in the room, <laughs> would say. <laughs> there is something. Uh, I've got a very strong motivation to uh, inspire people, entertain people, uh, make people laugh, tell stories, uh, but most of all for them to uh, to find vehicles for them to imagine their own worlds, and and that that is a passion, and that is something that's it's the same as a painter paints uh, because they got a passion for that medium. The medium I like is workshop because I just and and I like the fact that just like you wouldn't you couldn't ask Picasso before he painted what's that going to look like I don't know what it's going to look like and I like that unknown you know we don't know and people quite often they what's going to happen well I can tell you that you won't know what's going to happen if you've never done one of our residencies you've got oh, no idea. Yes what happens at the end and they're all nervous and but what is this gonna look like and so my energy's about kind of the people and um and god i am missing them i feel like i've been retired by amputation that somebody's over lockdown and the last year of not working with you because it's a year oh, since we did yeah. our, our show that ex yeah it's exactly a year now feels like somebody's cut off a limb and i I keep looking for the lost limb, you know, it's, it's, it's okay writing a book in a cabin, but it's not the same. <laughs> no, it's not the same. And uh, the chaos. I was reading something by Michael Mead that I thought of our work and I thought of you there. So it's, it says, being creative involves encountering inner and outer chaos over and over again. As all creation stories show, the condition before creation happens involves some kind of chaos. When I did, uh, I did residencies, as you know, before we became a collaborative company, which happened because of somebody who's watched some of this interview, Pippa, actually an encounter with Pippa started Creation Myth Puppets and my wife Claire was involved in 2012 and Creation Myth Puppets started then really and I met you in 2013 I think yep. or I worked with you anyway uh, before that I went to I, I used to work a lot by myself before I did that uh, residency with Martin and Mandy as well and I was in Wales, in Swansea, running uh, workshops. And a Welsh uh, education advisor said to me, Tony, the best creativity happens on the edge of chaos. And of course, look, what's out there now, Carol? What happens next? Somebody walking into the room, it, in, a, in a way, it has a chaos to it. I don't know what's going to, I don't know the next question you're going to ask. We live in an un unfolding, emerging world and work yes. that mirrors that. So to a certain extent, it's emerging. We put some knowns in place. We know the carpet's going to be there. We know we're going to get sticks and, and paper clips. We don't know what the kids are going to ask. We don't know how they're going to yes. respond. We don't know what they're going to look like, you know. And so even when you get 30 penguins in a class, they're all different. And they are all different. Yeah. And here's the other thing, they all reflect that human being who's made it. So you can't escape your own signature. It's there in the first cell that becomes you. And it's even in the shows, like as you mentioned, the 30, 
30 penguins when they're all coming out later on the parents they say oh i know which one is mine my yeah. son yeah. <laughs> we're like how did you it's the way they move the way it looks it's yeah. unbelievable yes it is and uh working with you one thing that inspires me so much it's your capacity for solving problems and the way you do it so fast because i remember so many things happen and we're like oh my god oh no oh and at the first you're like oh shit fuck shit fuck, oh my god oh my god <laughs> You're not, oh! not, not in front of and the then... children, folks. This shit fuck is in front of the company. No, yeah, not in front of the children. When... <laughs> and then it's the focus and dang, 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 dang. I love that. Well, I think that we, I, I mean, we've been, look, there really has been 100,000 children that I've worked with and I've worked in so many places and one of the things about workshop or any practice really is you develop practice through practice the discourse is is useful the theory is useful uh, but the practicalities of doing it are also useful but there's a sort of poetics to it where you take the understanding from one step beyond the actual making of it so you sort of get an understanding of the poetics of the situation that you just, you don't know, you, it's, it's through accretion, it's through drop, drop, drop of workshop after workshop. So when that head teacher comes in and says, I know you're supposed to be working with this class now and we've just spent an hour setting up for that class, but actually we need them to go out and do swimming. So could you work with this class of four-year-olds now? we kind of because we've worked with that many four-year-olds you know we can solve that problem or we know you we asked you to make a show but could you make a film instead <laughs> you know <laughs> which you can all watch basically on vimeo one day if you want to folks because that's one of the films you can watch anyway but anyway in working with you it's been incredible you were the best workshop leader i ever worked with and I, I love your awareness of this space, your 360, you can see what everyone is doing. And at the same time, the caring, that's the, like finding the balance, mm. it, the balance between the caring of one kid there, left-handed, does he have the right scissors? The other kid there is struggling with putting masking tape and also think, overseeing the artist, if everyone is doing like everyone is well and looking after the whole well, and holding it. Well, I, I, there is a moment where it became really clear to me that um, that's what working with children it was then. But I mean, any group is about is is getting that 360 degree radar and sense of what's happening behind you and yeah. and taking in what my, the potentials that are unwinding around you, all the dynamics. It happened that after I qualified as a youth and community worker, I got a job on an adventure playground in Pimlico oh. um, as assistant play leader, which was fine, but I was the only person working there. And they were the toughest kids you've ever worked with. I mean, they sort of the first day they all came in and spat at me. They were lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, it was difficult. And then there were the, the, counselor was li living in flats that overlooked the overlooked the um the playground and she'd bring me up and say there's a child with a big knife on your swings what are you going to do about it so i was assistant play leader and there wasn't another play leader so i went to the organization i said how can i be assistant there's no one here and they said we'll get someone down next week to kind of give <laughs> <laughs> it was impossible and there was uh, this guy came down and he looked he spent about an hour with me i mean he's i still was i mean i i kind of managed to get me a better job title <laughs> <I mean, laughs> that's another story but he looked around and his uh, his ability to see what was happening 
so impressed me. I thought, I want to be able to do that. And so I suppose that's another, it is about listening to your motivations and being receptive to the world and what it offers a bit. Uh, opens the things up and you can see, well, I don't know, that is something that I really think is important. And you know that a lot of people we work with get very stuck with one child or something or get you it's very artists do tend to have quite um focused sort of um, focus uh -huh. focus in on things in something yeah and as a workshop leader exactly creative process focus in social process focus out uh -huh. so you've got to kind and, of you've got and this how do you think we, we can learn that because i'm still learning i'm i'm still trying to learn to this reading the room for me is still a process which I admire and I'm trying to take in each time more but it's well you just keep wanting to do it I mean uh, you you there isn't look you know I anything you practice you don't you don't get to an end point where you learn it I don't feel my I mean you call me a genius on that thing but I don't think that I am a genius I think I've just found my element and I'm trying to kind of bring people into their own element because people uh, feel kind of whole when they're in their element. So that's my motivation. And in order to do that with a group, I've got to keep my eyes on the social dynamic that's going on and the individual creations that are going on. So I know that much. And... Uh, so that I'm just, it's just about making it your element and keep kind of, keep looking at things. And you've got, I mean, you've changed enormously since when we started seven, eight years ago working together. Yeah. And you do, but also, I mean, you're the, in a way, the person that's most uh, taken to the form that, um, that we work in. Other people want it to be slightly easier or less arduous or things. But I just want to make more. <laughs> you just like you just want to make the impossible possible, and that's what you do. I want to make the invisible visible, and the invisible visible too. Yeah, and also to be at service at for at others or for others, being service to others. Yes, that is what it's about. You're kind of in service to them. So you, the, so your question about has you got so much energy? You know, as soon as we get in the van at the end of the day, however long the day is, you know what I'm like at night. I'm walking around holding my head thinking, what have I done to myself? I am so tired. I, like, I get, we all get so tired and we have to come home at the end of these residencies and we kind of like please don't talk to me don't ask me any questions i've answered eight thousand questions every day i can't ask. <laughs> do you want a cup of tea just like, make me a cup of tea don't ask me you know <laughs> oh and you know that on this subject there we can talk there is so much talk there is a Okay. The laboratory of imagination. There's creation myths. There is so much I want to talk about, and also Canada. Canada, oh. Canada as well. You're working Canada. Well, I've been really lucky, uh, and I don't know how. People always say, "Where do you get these jobs from?" And I don't. I have no idea. I mean, I'm not. I'm not conventionally religious. Uh, I, it's not that I don't believe in kind of that there's real divinity in our world, that there are divine things in our world. But I don't believe in a kind of, particularly in a white bearded man sitting in the sky called God, you know. But I think that uh, yeah, some, somewhere it feels like uh, so there, there's some force. I do think that there's forces outside us that we kind of unconsciously tap into and I've been incredibly, and the one thing that's happened is the course of my career has had a tra trajectory that's just brought more and more things up. So I worked in Canada because when I started running workshops on workshop, 
the very first one I ran, there was a Canadian guy in there called Warren, who I'm writing the book with now. And he, he came and made a puppet. And he said, I've never made anything since school because I always thought I couldn't make anything. And you take me on a journey from I can't to I can. And, uh, and let's write a book together because I think workshops are formed too. And I said, well, I can't just write a book because I've got to keep earning money and I can't stop. You know, I've got to get a grant. So we put a project together called Mind Field, not mine, Mind with a D. And we ran a lot of workshops together and he got me over there and he was part of the Indigenous People's Health Research Centre. And uh, so I went over there and worked with indigenous people in Canada, which was life changing. I made friends. I miss them hugely because the person who ran the indigenous people's health research center, Joanne Episcopal, died very tragically. My best friend there, David Benjo, died tragically. Mm. There's a lot of death, a lot of tragedy in indigenous communities but i worked there I, I brought actually i just grabbed something before he came in and i carved this in a uh, in a uh, teepee camp and the elder came in and showed us how to how to carve out of ash and things and uh, ash. and they're also the traditional colors of i mean they're different traditional colors but the yellow black red and white of the medicine wheel representing all sorts of things like the four directions, the four seasons, the red, white, yellow, uh, brown people of the world, um, all the different uh, different things and the different uh, parts of the medicine, the mental, the physical, the emotional and the spiritual. And so I got to do all these things and work with these amazing kids that had such hard lives, but they were so beautiful and brilliant. And I worked with all these amazing people. And so I worked there for five years. And now we're writing the book. Ah, uh -huh. now you're writing the book. And I, I don't know what else to tell you about Canada. Oh, how about, I love the song that you wrote called Blown Away. You want to hear Blown Away? Yes, please. Uh, I'll try and put it on. Hold on. I've got, I've got to, I'll have to put it on. So one thing that happened was that way back when I was still a youth, well, when the, just before the, I started, I suddenly found out I was going to be a puppeteer of sorts. Uh, I lived next door to an Israeli guy called Assi. And I used to write poems before I became a puppeteer. I, I printed my own poetry books and tried to sell them in Hyde Park <laughs> <laughs> to people. And I did some poetry gigs. I did the first poetry gig I ever did was the Anarchist Christmas Party on Railton Road with a, with a reasonably famous guy now called Rory McLeod, who some of you might have heard about. Anyway, um, the Brixton riots happened, or the uprising, and um, I wrote a song about it uh, called Blown Away. And, uh, well, I wrote a song called Market Town, actually, so you know it as Blown Away. And um, I'll look for it. Hold on. I'm, and I, about 30 years later, um, Hold on, I've got to find it. So give me a second. I'm sorry. So no worries. 30 years later, my friend in Israel, who by then moved back to Tel Aviv, uh, said, you know that song that we, because uh, he took the poem and put it to music. He said, you know, oh, sorry. Um, you're going to have to wait a second, folks. It's this computer's not i should have lined it up because i sort of so and he said let's why don't we have another go at it so uh I, this is a version of it See, we can hear. this might be the first version can you hear it yes 
this is the first version of the way to Bakitown. No. no, 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 no. That is not the right version. That is actually the version because we got our friend um, to come I and I think we might run, run out of time soon, so I might have to put. All the way to Market Town, Market Town, Market Town. All the way to Market Town, I hear that spring. Took my love and. Could you put the volume up a bit? Oh, yeah. Please. Yeah. So, just to explain it, this parallels oh. the Brixton riots with the fact that I, I had a, new, a newish relationship with my future wife and also she was pregnant and a uh, baby was going our first child Harry was going to be born and Ashley painted a picture of my pregnant wife at that point I shall show you on the way to market town market town market town all the way to market town I that spring Took my love and laid it down Saw the stones were painted brown Before the houses were blown down Early that spring Oh! <laughs> Great! I'm sorry. So, no worries. I'm gonna... I'm gonna get the link. Uh, we yeah. can put the link on uh, on yeah. our talk uh, so yeah. people can listen to. I'll it. send you the link. Can I think we have only a few minutes left, okay. so I'm just gonna go through some quick questions now. Yeah. Yeah, I'll answer quickly. If you if you had a superpower, what would that be? A power. Yes, yeah, superpower. <laughs> Not energy, you already have plenty of that. Uh, my, my power would be to do with tennis and playing it better. Oh, <laughs> I'd, okay. like to, I'd like to play tennis every day of my life and, uh, and uh, have a really good game of tennis. I'd like to be a little bit more consistent on the tennis court. I don't mind being inconsistent anywhere else. But <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, if you could go back in time or anywhere in time where would you go where would i go oh, travel yeah. machine travel time machine i think i'd just go back to the uh isle of white pop festival and to see Jimi hendrix and the who and and all those things i'd revisit kind of that kind of incredible period with the roundhouse and the who and the stones and dylan and everything just kind of bursting and all that optimism and the hope of a kind of better future and and people talking about the environment when it started all the songs that started in you forget that 50 years ago people were saying the same thing as they're saying now but nothing's been done about it so i'd go mm -hmm. back there i'd go back there and with the kind of yeah okay and, well i will have to finish here because it's we are gonna get cut tony thank you so much i i thank you and tony genius and i'm gonna put uh the quote i already put that quote out there which the says the genius inside a person the genius inside a person wants activity it's connected to the stars it's connected to a spark and it wants to burn and it wants to make and it wants to create and it has gifts to give. That is its nature of inner genius, Michael Maid. So, Tony Genius, lovely to have you. And Carol, Michael Mead and Aladdin's lamp. That's what we do. We rub the lamp and the genius is coming. <laughs> and the gene. Yeah, that's exactly it. Beautiful. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And please, if you have any questions, send us.